Welcome back to the fifth talk in our Keeping in Balance series. We've just finished Lesson 17, Balance Through Surrender. This comes after weeks of looking at different areas of our lives that can get out of balance and learning about how God has some good guidelines for how to best bring things to a place of peace and order. So if we do all that we can to live according to these principles that we've learned, does that guarantee that everything is going to work out perfectly? Unfortunately, no. Which brings us to our current topic, what to do when it all falls apart. Perhaps nothing is more frustrating and unsettling is when life starts to unravel when we have been doing the best we can to do the right thing. We want life to feel balanced, ordered, and pleasant. There are times when applying the lessons in this Bible study will provide exactly what you need to experience a balanced life. Sometimes we're frustrated and unsettled because we've been ignoring God's command to rest and starting to live the Sabbath will make an enormous difference. Other times we'll realize that we were so busy living life according to other people's expectations of us that we never got around to living the way God desired. Making adjustments like these can be life-changing and bring the peace we have longed for. But what about those times when you've applied all the wisdom you've got to the situation at hand, but circumstances still go horribly wrong? What then? What are you to do when the grief is so thick that you can't breathe? When the shock and lack of control is so intense you feel like you're in a free fall? When the senselessness of it all causes you to wonder how God could possibly be good if he didn't step in and prevent the tragedy? Whenever we suffer, there seems to always be someone on hand who is available to offer platitudes and truths that rarely offer comfort. One of the reasons for this is it's not just that we all have unique reasons why we are suffering. We also are all unique people, which means that we each respond to suffering differently. What might offer me enormous comfort could feel completely irritating and insensitive to you, and vice versa. Because of this, there is no formula that can get us all through difficulty. It isn't a five-step process that we can check off as we progress. Sometimes we are suffering because we have messed up and we're living with the consequences. Other times we've done the right thing, but this rubbed others the wrong way and now they're making us miserable. We can experience the suffering of loss, of grief. And sometimes our suffering is caused by a senseless tragedy that we have no explanation for. Such a varied human experience coupled with the fact that we have different personalities and respond to things based on our temperaments this means that we need to be very careful when we discuss what we should do when it all falls apart. When we come close to someone suffering, we are entering sacred ground. We need to tread carefully and sensitively. So when I share my thoughts on this subject, please know that I recognize that I do not understand your unique situation. I have not walked in your shoes. As much as I want to understand, and I would feel compassion, no doubt, hearing your story, I am not you, and I cannot know what your pain feels like. The truth is, I can't even begin to make sense of the suffering I see in the world. The older I get, the more the curtain is pulled back and I hear heartbreaking stories of families, of global injustice, of the propensity for human evil, and I feel ill-equipped to say anything about the waves of pain that roar in the hearts of so many people. What I am left with most often is simply the question, why? We aren't the first to ask this question. This was also the cry of the heart of Job. Few have ever suffered the way that he did. In a short time period, he lost his wealth, his family, his health, and then his friends lost no time in telling him that he must have done something to deserve this punishment. They figured no other explanation could be given. Job called them troublesome comforters, and we can certainly understand why. Author and professor Don Carson described Job's friends in this way. There is a way of using theology and theological arguments that wounds rather than heals. This is not the fault of theology and theological arguments. It is the fault of the miserable comforter who fastens on an inappropriate fragment of truth or whose timing is off or whose attitude is insensitive or whose true theology is couched in such culture-laden cliches that they grate rather than comfort. In spite of the lack of comfort, Job remained faithful to God. 
But as his sufferings were layered one on top of the other, Job's desire to understand why God was allowing these things to happen intensified. God did respond to Job's question, but not in the way that you might expect. In fact, God never gave an answer to Job's question of why. Instead, he said, Who is this who darkens counsel with words of ignorance? Gird up your loins now like a man. I will question you, and you tell me the answers. Where were you when I formed the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its size? Surely you know. Who stretched out the measuring line for it? Into what were its pedestals sunk? And who lay its cornerstone, while all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Who shut within doors the sea when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling bands? When I set limits for it and fastened the bar of its door and said, Thus far shall you come, but no farther, and here shall your proud wave stop. In the words of Friedrich Buchner, God doesn't explain. He explodes. He asks Job who he thinks he is anyway. He says that to try to explain the kind of things Job wants explained would be like trying to explain Einstein to a little neck clam. God doesn't reveal his grand design. He reveals himself. And Evelyn Underhill echoed the sentiment when she wrote, if God were small enough to be understood, he wouldn't be big enough to be worshiped. I have difficulty understanding my son, who I've raised and known since he took his first breath. If I don't understand other people, even my own flesh and blood, why would I ever think I could understand God? Could it be that I've reduced God in my mind to something other than who he actually is? Have I reduced his role in my life to that of a very powerful and effective personal assistant? And then when he doesn't behave as such, I become indignant and angry. In his book, The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis wrote that God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Tim Keller applies that truth in a series of questions. It is only in suffering that we can hear God shouting a set of questions at us. Were things all right between us as long as I waited on you hand and foot? Did you get into this relationship for me to serve you or for you to serve me? Were you loving me before or only loving the things I was giving you? God didn't reveal his grand design to Job. He revealed himself, which brings us to the question, is he enough? Do we love God more than the things and the people he has given us? This is a big question and one worth wrestling with. When suffering hits, God doesn't usually provide explanations, but he always provides his presence. The more we love God, the greater comfort we'll receive from this. God is not remote. He isn't far away. In fact, he descended into the midst of human suffering when Jesus became a little baby. This truth is built right into the meaning of his name, Emmanuel, God with us. We never suffer alone. The poet Weeman describes this in this way, Christ is God crying, I am here. Although we want to know why, very often that question is never answered. While that is what we want to know, what we need to know is how. How will I get through this? As I said at the beginning, we all experience suffering uniquely, and things that are greatly helpful to one person can just as easily be grating to the next. But I believe there are some things that are important for all of us to dwell on in preparation for and during those times when it feels like it's all falling apart. Even if these are things that we don't feel like doing or thinking about, if we ignore them, then we'll greatly increase the chance that our difficulties will get the better of us. Suffering can be the very thing that refines us and makes us into the women God created us to be. But the only way that happens is if we make the choices along the way that keep us from simply becoming bitter 
angry, or just giving up. When everything in life feels like it's falling apart, we are encouraged to do something nice for ourselves, to get a massage, to get our nails done, to take some time off, to do something that will bring some pleasure back into our lives. What we're looking for is escape. While these things can provide some short-term comfort, when we're done with them, we're often left feeling exactly the same as before. The comfort isn't lasting. Instead of mentally checking out and escaping, I'd encourage you to take some time to think about the deeper things. What do I mean by that? Why does this matter? Let me ask, how do we tend to react when something painful happens? More often than not, we feel sideswiped. We can't believe that life has taken this horrible turn. We try to figure out where we went wrong, wondering if we could have prevented our circumstances. We're surprised, and we can't believe what's happening to us. Yet, we're told in 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. When life doesn't go the way we want it to, the first question most of us ask is why. When we ask why, we really want to know specifically why is this happening to us? We don't want philosophical answers about suffering in general. This is why it's a great idea to take some time to meditate on some of the key doctrines of our faith before things get rough. That way we have some truth to draw on when we're trying to make sense of things. Then, in the midst of the pain, these are the big picture truths we need to return to and remind ourselves of. In Philippians 4.8, St. Paul wrote, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. He wasn't talking about the power of positive thinking. He was challenging his readers to go deeper, to think long and hard about the honorable, just, pure, lovely, excellent, and praiseworthy core doctrines of our faith. This is the opposite advice you'd get if you read current self-help articles or books. From those sources, you'd be likely to be told how to relax better or achieve greater work-life balance. And while these techniques can come in handy, they don't ever answer the deeper questions that suffering exposes. If this life is all that there is, if there's nothing that comes after death, and if, there is no, and if there is no purpose here on earth other than having as much pleasure as you possibly can, then secular advice makes a lot of sense. But if there's a bigger picture, then we'd better understand what that's about. This is one of those cases when what we want isn't necessarily what we need. We want comfort, but could it be that we need truth? and that the truth will ultimately serve as a far deeper comfort. The reason I'm encouraging each one of us to think deeply, to do the work ourselves of meditating on the big truths of our faith, is because we will rarely receive these reminders from another person when we are hurting. It simply makes us angry. But if we have already stored these truths in our heads and in our hearts, then the Holy Spirit can bring them to our minds in a way that we receive much more readily. So what core truths of our faith am I talking about? We have got to know God's truth about four key areas, creation, fall, rescue, and resurrection. And I can't cover everything we need to know about these truths today. So I challenge you to take the time to prayerfully think and study about them on your own. But in a nutshell, a truly insufficient summary, let's look at them one by one, starting with creation. When we think of suffering, we have to remember that this is not how God intended the world to work. What we experience on earth is not God's plan A. When God created the world, there was perfect peace. There was no cruelty, infidelity, divorce, infertility, disease, or death. There was no such thing as sexual abuse, sex trafficking, or natural disaster. His desire was that people would always live in this state of paradise, in perfect relationship to him. Then there's the fall. 
God never wanted sin to enter the world, nor did he cause it. God didn't want to create robots. He wanted people to choose to love him freely. Because of this, he gave man free will, the ability to choose. Sin entered the world when man failed to trust that loving and obeying God would always be the better, safer choice. Man chose to love self over God. Chaos resulted. When sin was chosen over loving obedience to God, everything changed. From that point on, death and heartache became a part of life. Sin created a chasm between man and God, which brings us to the rescue. Sin brought the need for forgiveness. In order for us to be able to draw close to God again, our sins needed to be punished. And God, as the creator of the universe, had predetermined the consequence of sin, death. We read this in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. God is totally loving, but he is also totally just. He couldn't just say that sin doesn't matter. The truth is we don't want him to. When we think about heinous crimes that make our blood boil, we want justice. In so many cases, we cry out for retribution. We want the guilty punished. But when it comes to ourselves, we want God to go easy on us. But that's not how it works. In the words of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, if only it were all so simple. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? The truth is, we are all in need of someone to rescue us from the consequences of our sins. No person, no matter how holy, can bridge the distance between themselves and God through good works. We will always fall short of perfect holiness, and that is what God requires. As it says in Romans 3:23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Instead of making each one of us pay the price for our sins, which is death, Jesus stepped in and said, punish me instead, kill me instead. When Jesus hung on the cross, all the sins of the past, present, and future were placed on him. He paid the price for all of them. Jesus then offered us the divine exchange. We offer him our sins. He paid the price for them, and then he offers us his righteousness in exchange. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. King David hinted at this when he wrote the following in Psalm 3, 4, You, Lord, are a shield around me my glory. You keep my head high. Jesus literally became our shield. He shielded us from the blows that we deserve that would have destroyed us. And miraculously, he didn't just shield us. He now presents us holy, without blemish, and irreproachable before God. Colossians 1:22. We are so very wrong when we think that we deserve an easy, comfortable life. What we deserve is death. When we think that God owes us something, it reveals that we have far too small and inadequate a view of God. But the end of the story isn't our rescue, it's resurrection. God doesn't just desire to see us forgiven, he wants to see us totally free, restored, and experiencing new life. It's because of this that we have hope. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He rose from the dead, and that changes everything. In doing so, he proved that he is victorious over and stronger than all the things that cause suffering. One day, he will make everything right again. One day, the suffering will end. 
One day, the one who sits on the throne will shelter us. We will not hunger or thirst anymore, nor will the sun or the heat strike us. For the Lamb who is in the center of the throne will shepherd us and lead us to springs of life-giving water. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Revelation 7, 15 through 17. And then in Revelation 21, 4 to 5, we read, Behold, God's dwelling place is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will always be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain, for the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Hold on to hope. Remember, restoration is coming. It's not just that God will judge evil. He will restore everything. In heaven, all will be made right. As Tim Keller writes in his book, Walking with God Through Suffering and Pain, think big and high. Realize who God is, what he has done, who you are in Christ, where history is going. Put your troubles in perspective by remembering Christ's troubles on your behalf and all his promises to you and what he is accomplishing. Let me put it another way. There is a stupid piece and then there is a smart piece. The stupid piece comes from refusing to think about your overall situation. If you go that way, you can pop a cork, sit under a tree or on the beach, and try not to think about the grand scheme of things. But if you are a Christian, you can think about the big picture. And as you do, you are going to find peace. And if you are a Christian and you have no peace at all, it may be that you are simply not thinking. None of this means that suffering doesn't hurt. These truths do not take away the sting of betrayal, the frustration of losing control, or the grief of loss. But these truths can help us. They can help us to see our lives in a new way as we develop an eternal perspective on our circumstances. In his book, A Grace Revealed, Jerry Sitzer shares lessons learned through extreme suffering. 20 years ago, he lost his daughter, wife, and mother all in the same car accident. The grief was overwhelming, and his writing is honest and powerful. He had this to say about living with pain while we long for heaven. Eventually, we will live happily ever after, but only when the redemptive story ends, which seems a long way off. In the meantime, you and I are somewhere in the middle of the story, as if stuck in the chaos and messiness of a half-finished home improvement project. We might have one chapter left in our story, or we might have 50. We could experience more of the same of years to come, or we could be on the verge of a change so dramatic that if we knew about it, we would faint with fear or wonder, or perhaps both. We could be entering the happiest phase of our lives, or the saddest. We simply don't know and can't know. In my mind, there is only one good option. We must choose to stay in the redemptive story. However unclear it must be to us, we can trust that God is writing the story. God is writing a story with each one of our lives. I promise you, the end of the story he writes is redemption and resurrection. But through the trials that are inevitably a part of each of our stories, in the words of Tim Keller, we must remember to treat God as God and as there. His presence changes everything. As we wait to experience the glory of heaven, he stays here with us. He sees each tear we shed, but not just that. He weeps with us. He holds our hands as we wade through this world, 
all the while reminding us that there is something better coming. Heaven is just around the corner, and what we'll see there, we can't even imagine. But it's coming. As it says in Hebrews 6, 19, and we have this hope as an anchor for our souls, firm and secure. Will you pray with me, please? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we invite you into that sacred space of our suffering. We ask that you, Holy Spirit, would be our teacher, that you, Jesus, as our brother, would sit alongside us holding our hand and offering us comfort. May we feel utterly surrounded by you so that we never are led astray by the lie that we are all alone. May we fix our eyes on heaven, knowing that there is something better just around the corner, that you are so far greater than our minds can possibly comprehend, that while we are incapable of understanding the why, you do help us through the how. Thank you for never leaving us. Help us to come to know you more and more every day so that your presence means the world to us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.